So friends, Christmas is coming. Anyone put up their lights yet? Some people are like a week ahead? Yeah? I got mine up yesterday. I have a bit of dueling lights going on with our neighbor. So uh, um, I texted him, let him know that uh, my lights were up before his. Um, so uh, he was scrambling out there. No. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we ended up getting a tree. It was a Christmas miracle yesterday. Actually, no, Advent miracle. Uh, I went to a tree farm and uh, we pulled up and it was the first, li- literally the first tree we saw. It was the first tree we saw. And everyone agreed on it. And then we did ask the guy, could we tag it and look around? He's like, yeah, sure. But it was really interesting because the tree was like right beside the guy's house. And so we're like, is that, is that part of the, the farm? He's like, oh, yeah. And we're like, oh, everyone's been passing it by because it looked so good. <laughs> and, like, and all the other trees are a little bit smaller. And, and we're like, okay. So, so there we are. We, uh, we had a Christmas miracle and uh, we... I don't think we even fought. I don't even think we fought during that time too. So anyone ever fight when you're getting your trees or setting up your lights? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, miracle. It was amazing. And so uh, anyway, that happens in our house. We're, we're normal people. Um, and so it was wonderful. <laughs> it happened last year too. Um, anyway, but uh, we're, we're on a roll here. So it's good. But we put up uh, uh, lights uh, today, this afternoon. We're going to be going to where, uh, what's the place? It, is it Christmas Manor? That was where she used to live. We're going to a hospital, which is uh, a, a, and a hospice as well. And in the courtyard of the, of the hospice, since, my, since uh, Sharon's gran had lived there, um, with her aunt, we have gone and in the, in the, in the courtyard where all the, the trees are and the leaves have fallen, we uh, put up uh, ornaments. And so red, gold, silver, little ornaments everywhere in, the, in, in there. And in, in, the, in the Easter time, we put up Easter eggs. And uh, we've been doing this now for five years or so. And so Sharon's grand passed away two years ago or more, two years ago. And so we've just continued to do it. They, they said, would you keep coming back? And so, uh, so we're going to go there, and it's our first Sunday or so, first week of Advent, we do this. So people in the courtyard, and they just love it. They love to see the, you know, I guess the, the glittering bulbs in the middle of the courtyard in the midst of uh, winter. And um, now Sharon's uh, aunt and uncle are moving to Manitoba, so now they're wanting to give us all the Christmas bulbs. And so uh, we might have to get a self-storage for that. Um, but uh, we take some time to, to decorate. We take some time to get ready uh, for Christmas. We prepare our homes for the celebration to come. But even more important, maybe not more important, just as important, I would say, because <laughs> um, I don't want to belittle it, is our preparation of our hearts. Preparation of who we are as a people Uh, Prepare our hearts for the celebration to come. Advent season is a beautiful reminder to do that. As we prepare our homes, can we be reminded that we are to be be, prepared? Wow, what did I just say? Did I just? Can I have an interpreter there? No. Okay, it was nonsense then. Okay, we we are to prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of a Savior, Jesus, and. At the start of this four-week celebration, or four-week pondering, I would say, contemplation, we have lit the candle of hope. Um, And so I hope that as we do this, uh, we are reminded of the hope that is in Jesus Christ. So not just around the, the scurrying and maybe Cyber, Cyber Monday clicking. There's, good, there's the Giving Tuesday as well, so think about that. Um, maybe this year we can be contemplative as we prepare our hearts. So my question for you, is your heart filled with hope? Do you have an expectation for tomorrow? And what happens then if we don't? What happens if the road ahead is filled with stress, hardship, suffering? Weight on our shoulders slows us down. 
when confident expectation for tomorrow dwindles, what can we do? How can we walk in hope when it feels hopeless inside? Some of us maybe want to only talk about hope all the time because it's hard to get to those dark places. I love the, the, the liturgy that we read earlier. It, 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 uh, it says, um, well, a prayer here. Uh, all we, Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. So as we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for hope, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. It's a hope that God is going to work in and through us. And then later on, the, the prayer, it says, um, we open up all the dark places and memories in our lives to the healing light of Christ. I hope that we we're able to do that to a God who is loving and gracious towards us in that way. Um, I want to suggest this morning that we would slow down and contemplate um, and to think what Advent, longing, waiting means. Uh, the Christian church calendar is marked with the retelling of time. Um, and the, the church's start of the year is now, today. This is the anticipation. Um, this is, uh, it starts with a waiting, a longing. And uh, it, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. We're waiting for something to happen. And then in four weeks from now, five weeks from four or in a bit, we'll celebrate the, the birth of Jesus. But let's not get there yet. We can wait in hope. In the four weeks of Advent, we learned how to hope. We reorientate our lives in the direction of hope and the expectation of a God that will act. And as we'll see in the Christmas story, God might act in ways that might be hard to recognize. Um, one author, Brian Zahn, writes this, The ways of God are predominantly small and quiet. The ways of God are about as loud as a seed falling on the ground or bread rising in the oven. The ways of God are almost never found in the shouts of the crowd. The ways of God are, almost, are often found in the trickling tears and whispering prayers. We want God to do a big thing while God is planning to do a small thing. We are impressed by the big and loud. God is not. We are in a hurry. God is not. We want God to act fast, but God's speed is almost always slow. And he surprises us with the big things. But as you look back in your life, you wonder about the trickling tears, the whispered prayers, and so I want to remind us a little bit about the bigger meta-narrative of Scripture here um, that we want to see. And this is a good introduction for us in hope and in, in Advent, where the days are getting darker. So we light candles of hope that represent Jesus, the light of the world in our lives. But the ancient Israel, Israelites knew suffering. Uh, I had um, our, I don't, many of you don't know, but we're part of the Mennonite Brethren denomination. And um, so, actually, probably a lot of you do know that. It's not, we're not keeping a secret, but we're part of that denomination. <clears throat> and, um, and there's a new sheriff in town. I'm joking if you're listening, Reg. Um, but uh, the, 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 old, the, the most recent um, head of the conference uh, retired, and so there's a new guy. His name's Reg Taves. And he took me out for coffee the other day. Actually, he came to our ministry center, and I, uh, I uh, made him a coffee, and we chatted. And uh, one of his questions was, where do you see God working in your people nowadays and now? My first response, actually, I don't know if it shocked him or not. I said, I see God working in the midst of suffering. And he was like, oh, wrote it down. He's like, well, yeah, I guess that's quite biblical. <laughs> I said, yes, it is. And so we as a people, uh, corporately, you know, just lamented and said farewell to Peter. Uh, and all the while, we walk with Diane during this time. And so, uh, and Peter was able to show us how to die well. Not everyone has that opportunity. 
to be in a hospice for almost six weeks and to be very lucid and, and with it for five. And we were able to lament with him. We were able to walk in the midst of suffering with them both. And so we saw God work there. And Peter had this statement where someone said to him, and I've mentioned it here before, he said, uh, someone texted him and said, uh, make sure you just hold on to God, keep holding on to God. And Peter said, do you know what my response to that person was? I said, yeah. I said, well, he just said, well, I know that God is holding on to me even when I can't hold on to God. That should be something we should be mulling over during Advent. That God is holding on to us. God is holding on to humanity even when it looks like humanity is going to blow itself up. Individually and corporately. We're walking through... uh, over a week, is almost two weeks with Lana. <clears throat> Suffered a stroke with him in the hospital yesterday. And there's this quiet hope. And yet, Lana was able to say, It's okay to cry. I said, Yes, Lana, it's okay to cry. And yet you hear in her this hope and she's full of humor and fun. And yet right now, she's able to cry. And we cry with them as we pray and we walk with them. And we know that there's stories of great goodness and God working in her life. And in in Lana's life in particular, 20 years ago, this kind of thing happened before. And she said, it happened before, it can happen again. Beautiful song that you chose today, Julia. I believe that was a song for Lana. And so we walk with each other in the midst of suffering, and we see that God is with us. And the ancient Israelites knew this as well. Um, I'm going to hack and slash here. Oh my goodness. They were held captive in Egypt as slaves, and God heard their cry for mercy, suffering people. And so they called the unexpected, stuttering, nomadic herdsman, who, oft, who also happened to be a fugitive, his name was Moses, to take on a then-known superpower, Egypt. And God acts and pulls this people out of slavery and promises of their own land. But guess what? They wander for 40 years. And he shows up how? They're like, we, don't, we want to go back. We, wanna, we like the leeks and the onions, and we love Egypt. It's good. And God goes, no, no. I mean, shows up with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. And then they say, we're hungry. He says, okay, you're hungry? All right, I'm going to give you just enough for 40 years. Manna just shows up. And manna, the word manna is like, what is this? That's what he means. What is, what is this? Oh, okay, it's good. It's good for today. And they couldn't store it up. Otherwise, it would rot. So for 40, 40 years, God shows up just with enough, with stuff that they said, what is this? So the Israelites knew of this longing, this suffering. <clears throat> and then they receive their land, and they get organized as a nation, a nation that was to look different in many ways. Through, through this, I'm giving a really quick overview, and Yahweh's to be their king, and they're to look different, and to be a light to the surrounding nations, um, but they don't always look, always uh, like that idea, um, and what happened was, later on, um, you know, the narrative talks about, uh, once they became this, this nation, then what happens? Then Babylon comes in and destroys them and takes them captive for a really long time again, and they know suffering. And then the prophet Isaiah spoke about and wrote about a king, a coming king, one that would bring hope, and his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. And then they had to wait again hundreds of years. But their longing was a hope that God's people would be freed from the violence and oppression from other nations. So this people that God calls his own understand the hardship, the heartache, the wilderness, the oppression, and the suffering. And this is part of the story that should not come as a surprise to us as 2024 Christians. 
It's embedded in the narrative. So if we're walking through suffering right now in darkness, that's part of the story. So during this four-week period of adventing waiting, advent waiting, we read Israel's poems and prayers and prophets. We read their stories in our, as we light the candles, um, that are speaking of a hope that will be for all nations, that will come from Israel through a suffering people. And that this king will rule differently, a king that will be called Emmanuel God with us. This Advent season, the church calendar is a time of waiting, a time of hoping and acting and longing for God. And so Isaiah <clears throat> speaks the words here that um, were read for us this morning. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For us, a child is born. For us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on, from time, that time on and forever. The zeal of the Almighty Lord will accomplish this. So this is the longing, this is the waiting. What we talked about a couple weeks about the kingdom of God, living in the here and the not yet. In a few minutes, we're going to uh, share communion together. And there's this, there's this understanding that God is with us here now. In the past, broke, <clears throat> given his body to us, shed his blood for us. And now he's here with us now and it's in the taking of the bread that we say, yes, God, you're with us. And it's in the hope and anticipation that God will return again. <clears throat> and so we live in the, in the now and the not yet, between the now and, yet, and not yet. And so God shows up in little whispers in places and spaces that maybe we might not notice. So we're going to celebrate God with us. God with us in birth, in life, in sorrow, in suffering, and even in death, that we might then be with God in the resurrection. And this is the great hope that we have. But before the hope, we can't get there too quickly. It's okay to lament. And it's okay to be drawn. As Lana says, it's okay to cry. I'm not going to be able to read it all, but there's an interesting psalm in Psalm 98. Psalms are uh, Israel's worship book. Psalm 88 is a, Beautiful psalm of lament. It's, it it will, will catch you a little bit off guard as you read it. Uh, but most lament psalms will always, they'll talk about, they'll start off by going, uh, God, my Savior. Then they'll say, where are you? Why come rescue me? And then, then as, he, as the, the psalmist is praying, there's always usually a bit of a turn at the end of the psalm. Yet I will praise you. Psalm 88 ends with, and darkness is my friend. And so you, what do you do with that? N.T. Wright says that what, what you need to sit with is the you in the psalm. Not the you, but the you, where it says, you are my salvation. And because of the God who gives us salvation, the God who is with us, the God who knows suffering, is, understands to be walking with people in the midst of hardship, this is the you that you're able to say, where are you? And it's in that hopeful darkness that we wait for a God that has acted and yet for some of us it's okay to say right now you might be able to some of you might be able to say darkness is my friend and so we can't jump to Christmas too quickly we might have to sit in the painful understanding and maybe in our own maybe things are going really well in your life and that's a beautiful thing but maybe you're also then able to sit in somebody else's suffering and as we, as we sit, in a sense, and pray for Stuart and Lana, we're doing that as a community as well. And we say it's okay to cry. But we cry and we lament, knowing at some point there is resurrection. And yet it's okay to not get there too quickly. Um...
I'll leave us with this one quote, then I want to bring us to communion table. <clears throat> Sorry, this is the dyslexic that's hacking and slashing his sermon right now. <laughs> I have to read it. Um, I'll, I'll end with one other, uh, I have too many quotes here. I'll just end with one quote with Brian Zond here at the end. Um, I think it's in there, Tracy. Waiting for God to act only seems like waiting for God to act. God is always acting because God is always loving the world and always giving birth to something. Waiting for God to act is actually waiting for your soul to become quiet enough and contemplative enough to discern what God is doing in the obscure and forgotten corners, far from the corridors of power or wherever you think the action is. Um, A person that I was walking with during suffering mentioned um, to me that their loved one and with tears in her eyes, said, my spouse is revealing God's good gift to me even while I sit here and suffer. Um, what, what a beautiful picture <laughs> where you're waiting and longing for a miracle to happen and yet God is still working in the midst of you waiting and longing for the miracle to happen. Do we have eyes to see? Um, God often quite, Jesus talks in parables quite often about the mustard seed or the leavened bread, which was quoted earlier. That kingdom of God comes in small places and it grows in in spaces that we might not see. Would we have eyes to see that? Um, Would we have an opportunity to sit in our sadness maybe Um, or someone else's sadness uh, and cry with them. In the midst of this, would we also, for some of us, be able to see the hope that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the one that shines so the darkness will not overcome it. And this is the good hope of the gospel for us too. So today we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. Um, The table that reminds us that, yes, God did act in history. He does act in the present and will decisively act in the future when all things will come under his lordship. But for now, we see that God himself is also waiting, waiting for people to respond to his love, waiting for people to hear his still small voice, and waiting for people to wait for God. May we wait for God together as we participate in this supper. Um, We're going to, uh, the last couple of times we've taken communion a little bit differently. It's just a little bit easier to to manage. So as I prep us, we're going to um, just get out the housekeeping right away. And uh, pass this along. <laughs> it is flu season. So just uh, clean your hands. <laughs> um, as I open this up, we're going to be passing the bread and the juice that represents Jesus' body and represents his blood. Before we do that, and as you're uh, doing your hands, um, I want to make mention that uh, Dwight Friesen, who isn't able to be with us here, make sure that you come up, um, you could come up during the last worship song or uh, once we have communion, feel free to come up and, and, uh, and uh, look at this. Uh, Julie has asked artists in our community to uh, paint um, 
uh, or do some kind of creation for each of the um, each of the the candles. So today's candle is hope, and so I'll read this what uh, what Dwight uh, has created for us. It says this: "Hoping for rain." This is what he's called this. The world in which I grew up turned on two seasons, rainy and dry. By the end of the dry season, the red earth common to the area was bronze and barren. We could smell that first rain on the wind, intoxicating and pungent with the hope of relief from the suffocating dust and heat. It couldn't come soon enough. Dark skies and distant bands of rain sparkling in the Saharan, dry, Saharan sun stirred our anticipation of the brilliant green, sprout, sorry, brilliant green sprouts that would carpet the land overnight. The piece is metallic acrylic on textured surface, which is shifting lights and highlights, varied elements and, and symbolism, sometimes dry roots or thorns with varying light. On the first day of Advent, O Christ, to adapt the words of Bruce Coburn. The thought of you comes on like the feeling of the coming rains. Dwight. So friends, who's invited to the table? The young and the old, the rich and the poor the lowest and the least, sinners and saints together with, in here, together, communion. Come find your place here where there's no strangers or foreigners, only brothers and sisters in the sight of God. Why do we give thanks at the table for this table? We give thanks because Jesus showed us the way. We give thanks because Jesus is the way. Jesus was a gift from God for the world. He was called Emmanuel, God with us. He came to save us from our sins. Jesus lived a life of thankfulness and gave his life as a sacrifice for many. We give thanks that he is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Why do we eat and drink at this table? We eat because on the night before Jesus died, he ate with his friends. He gave them bread and said, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. At that same meal, he took a cup of wine and said, Drink this cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What do we remember at this table? We remember Jesus' birth and his presence as God with us. We remember Jesus' life and his love. We remember Jesus' suffering and death on the cross as a reminder that God is with us in the very hard and terrible places. We remember the resurrection and the promise of life. We remember that we are waiting in hope to see Jesus again.